Good Yontav again, everybody, and Hag Sameach. It's so nice to see many of you here. At the end of our service, please stay. We will have an opportunity to gather in our sukkah courtyard for Kiddush. There's a little, some Passover treats and some matzah. There's some of you I haven't seen in a year. So please stay. I want to greet every single one of you. Wish you a Hag Sameach. And again, to tell you how pleased I am that so many of you have joined us this morning. This, of course, is a special day for us as, as Jews, as our Christian friends celebrate Easter. This, of course, is our last day of Passover and is the custom, the last day of each Shlosh Regalim, each festival holiday, is a chance to remember those who've gone before us, to commemorate them with Yisker. And today, as we celebrate the eighth day of Passover, the last day of this Kog, and our Christian friends celebrate Easter, we may think a lot about what it means to be an American, what it's meant for previous generations, and what it means today for us in the year 2021. In 1860, when Abraham Lincoln was elected president, at the time, he wasn't thought of as a man given to religious fervor. But that would soon change. Because over the next four and a half years, as hundreds of thousands of Americans died in the Civil War, our 16th president evolved into a theologian of the American idea. He would use the language and concepts of the Bible to reflect on the Civil War's larger meaning. Why, for instance, did Lincoln begin the Gettysburg Address with the words four score and seven years ago? Some may think it's because that's the way he spoke, but that's not true. As Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik teaches us today, he knew that his audience at the time was deeply familiar with the King James Bible and would recognize the language of the Psalms. As it's written in that Bible, the days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength, they be fourscore years. For you see, the Bible's influence on the language of our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, can be seen even before he took office. In February of 1861, with the South rebelling and the future of the Union hanging in the balance, the president-elect received an unusual gift from a Jewish immigrant named Abraham Cohn. Abraham was from Bavaria. He had ended up in Chicago and he was fiercely committed to both his Judaism and Republican politics. And he was convinced at the time, as his daughter later wrote, that Lincoln was the destined Moses of the slaves and the savior of the United States. The gift that Cohn sent the president reflected those convictions. It was a framed painting of an American flag on whose stripes Cohn had inscribed Hebrew verses from the book of Joshua. He wrote, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Shortly after receiving that painting, Lincoln departed Springfield, Illinois for his inauguration in Washington, D.C. And using that painting, he reflected similar language. Before the train pulled out of the station in Springfield, Illinois, Lincoln declared, I now leave not knowing when or wherever I may return with a task before me greater than I ever could have imagined. But without the assistance of the divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. The echo of the verses from Joshua is striking. And the historian Harold Holzer believes that Lincoln was clearly inspired by Abraham Cohn's present, noting that as president, that framed American flag was displayed in the White House all four years of his presidency. Lincoln's mind remained on the Bible during that two-week-long journey to Washington. In Trenton, New Jersey, he gave a speech to the state Senate in which he recalled reading as a child about George Washington's battle for the city. I recollect thinking then, he reflected, boy, even though I was, that there must have been something more than common that those men struggled for, that something even more than national independence, that something held out a great promise to all the people of the world of all time to come. 
it was his intention, Lincoln continued, to serve as a humble instrument in the hands of the Almighty. And of this, his almost chosen people. The American founding Lincoln suggested for the first time was about more than independence for one country. By referring to Americans as an almost chosen people, Lincoln drew a comparison between his country and biblical Israel, which according to the book of Genesis was brought into being so that all the families of the world would be blessed. The American founding too, Lincoln suggested, was about more than independence for one country. It was destined to embody an ideal of human equality, a great promise for all the world. Lincoln traveled on to Philadelphia, where on Washington's birthday he visited Independence Hall. And while bidding good night to a crowd, Lincoln offered another impromptu biblical reflection. He said, all my political warfare has been in favor of the teachings coming forth from this sacred hall where the Declaration of Independence was signed. And then he said something amazing. He said, may my right hand forget its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I ever prove false to those teachings. The audience at the time would have recognized Lincoln's allusion to Psalm 137. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its cunning. In the Bible, Jerusalem was home with the Ark of the Covenant, the reminder of God's promise to all Israelites. Independence Hall, Lincoln implied, was the American Jerusalem. And the doctrine that all men are created equal was the covenant of the almost chosen people. In the impending civil war, Americans' dedication to that covenant would be tested. Lincoln's biblical reflections on America reached full flowering in his second inaugural address delivered in March of 1865. More than a sermon, more a sermon than a political speech, it's considered one of the most remarkable speeches in American history. And in that speech, he called his country to repentance and described the Civil War as God's punishment for American slavery, concluding with the psalmist declaration that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The historian Paul Johnson has noted that it is impossible to imagine any other statement, statesman of Lincoln's time, Disraeli, Napoleon, Bismarck, giving such a speech. Only Americans were accustomed to seeing themselves in such biblical terms. Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth just weeks later on the evening of Friday, April 14th, when Christians were observing Good Friday. The next morning, as news of the president's death spread, Jews were heading to synagogue for the Sabbath of Passover. They heard the news from their fellow Americans on the day of the celebratory service held on the Sabbath during Passover. As terrible as it was, Lincoln's death on Passover and the American Jews joining their observance of this holiday with their mourning of his death is very fitting. For as Britain's former chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, may he rest in peace, notes in his commentary on the Haggadah. He writes, in a strange way, civil religion has the same relationship to the United States as Passover does to the Jewish people. It is first and foremost, not a philosophy, but a great story. It tells how a persecuted group escaped from the old world and made a hazardous journey to an unknown land, there to construct a new society. In Abraham Lincoln's famous words, conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Like the Passover story, it must be told repeatedly, as it is in every inaugural address. That notion defines our nation not merely in terms of the past, but also as a moral, spiritual commitment to the future. My friends, it's no accident that the founders of America turned to the Hebrew Bible or that successive presidents have done likewise because there's no other text in Western literature that draws on these themes. Israel, ancient and modern, and the United States are the two supreme examples of societies constructed 
in such a conscious pursuit of a great idea. On that Shabbat at Passover 1865, Shabbat services turned into a double commemoration of the exodus from Egypt and the life of a man, many in the American Jewish community of the time and many in the American community called America's Moses. Mary Lincoln would later report that just before her husband died, the president had reflected that there was no city on earth he so much desired to see as Jerusalem. On that Passover, Lincoln was mourned by American Jews who had just concluded their seders with the words, next year in Jerusalem. Today, in a few moments, at this Yisker, we remember those who we spent countless seders with while reciting those words, next year in Jerusalem. Lashana haba'a b'yerushalayim. And when we said it, when our loved ones said it, we dreamed of a better world for us as Jews and for people everywhere. And like Lincoln, those who we remember today, they weren't perfect. They had their failures, their shortcomings. They made mistakes. Lincoln had a very impressive list of failures. He lost his job in 1832. Lincoln was defeated for the state legislature in 1832. He failed in business in 1833. His sweetheart passed away in 1835. He had a nervous breakdown in 1836. He was defeated for Speaker of the House in 1838. He was defeated for nomination for Congress in 1843. He lost renomination in 1848. He was rejected for land officer in 1849. Lincoln was defeated for U.S. Senate in 1854. He was defeated for nomination for the vice president in 1856. And he was again defeated for the U.S. Senate in 1858. I think most people by that time would have given up, but not Abraham Lincoln, as he was elected president in 1860. Like Lincoln, our loved ones also learned from their failures. Many of them became better people for them. And we learned from them on how they reacted. And so many of them gave us the resolve and resiliency that helped so many of us, especially over the past 13 months. But like Lincoln, those who we remember today were also striving to create a better world. They would say, Lashana Habab Yerushalayim next year in Jerusalem, and then spend the year trying to make the world a giant city of peace. Some of our loved ones used the Bible to derive their life's values and goals. They would speak freely about their love of Jewish customs and traditions, community, and of Israel. Many of them gave us that love of Judaism that we have worked so hard to pass on to our offspring, especially during the holiday of Passover. All of them had moral lessons and wisdom that we continue to cherish. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. All of them inspired us, pushed us, and made us the people we are today. Like Lincoln, some of our loved ones' lives were cut short as well. But like our 16th president, they instill impacted our lives and made our world much better. This Passover, this Yisker, let us reflect on how we will keep their ideas alive. How will we continue to cherish their memories? What ideals will we continue to live out? What legacies will we make sure are passed on to future generations? And like Lincoln, we remember a man who inspires us to this day. Can our loved ones still do that for us? Whether it's Passover, Shabbat, or any day of the week. My friends, today on this Passover, our rabbis gave us a gift. A time not just to end the holiday and get back to our hummets, but more importantly, a time to reflect on those who made Passover so special for us for year after year and continue to do so in a very different and unique way. May the loved ones and the memory of our loved ones continue to inspire us. And may they all continue to rest in peace.